So now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Ajit uh, Patra, uh, who's going to talk about enabling better pregnancy monitoring, uh, the case of point of care diagnosis in fetal, fetal echo, <laughs> echocardiography. Hello, good afternoon everybody. So I'm Arijit from the University of Oxford. I work at the Institute of Biomedical Engineering there. And I mostly study automation of fetal ultrasound using machine learning and computer vision and biomechanical models. So today I will talk about bringing point of care ultrasound for fetal echocardiography in the light of recent introductions in, sorry. Okay. So before we move into the technicalities of it, I would like to have some motivation about why we do fetal ultrasound, why fetal ultrasound automation, and what next for fetal ultrasound. So the reason why fetal ultrasound is so important is because when you talk about prenatal health monitoring or even growth assessments or diagnosis of anomalies in the developing fetus, usage of other modalities like, you know, imaging modalities like CT or MRI are highly contentious. While MRI can be used, but in most health systems, due to the process of heat generation or in general the irritability of the fetus to MRI restricts it to not beyond six weeks. So ultrasound becomes the predominant modality for anomaly scanning. And I focus primarily on monitoring of the fetal heart, reason being that congenital heart diseases and associated complications are a leading cause of infant mortality. Around 42% of infant mortality worldwide can be accounted for congenital heart disease. All said and done, the human capital required to do adequate health monitoring is not particularly optimistic. In India, for example, there are one in 200,000 sonographers. And when I say sonographers, I'm including a really broad definition of sonographers who can do a basic scanning protocol. Actual diagnosis of CHD would require a lot more specialism. Uh, you have to be a cardiologist, then you have to specialize in fetal cardiology. So as such, uh, the upshot is that not only is the capital expertise in capital equipment in short supply, so is the human expertise. And this is a ripe avenue for disruption in the sense that if you could automate fetal ultrasound monitoring, that would be a huge step forward for achieving the goal of healthcare for all, at all ages. So we consider a case for fetal heart assessments. Specifically, we start with a visibility and a viewing plane assessment for a proof of concept of deploying uh, resource constrained ultrasound algorithms. The reason why ultrasound is so particularly complicated as compared to you know, relatively friendlier modalities like computer tomography or MRI is that A, most of the features that are observed in ultrasound in the fanning window are really, really small and are also complicated by anatomical appearances in a very short region. On top of that, there is a predominance of speckle artifacts, enhancements, uh, stochastic presence of shadows, variations of contrast, and all of this is done in a really short time where the sonographer who specifically does the ultrasound has to juggle through multiple responsibilities such as viewing plane identification, freezing of images, gender de determination, counseling the patient, and so on and so forth. And this specific aspect becomes particularly pronounced in resource constrained healthcare systems in India, China, in Africa where the time allocated per patient is way below global standards. We, in this case, talk about fetal heart assessment, which we model as a video understanding problem. Analysis in these cases can be frame level or can be at the level of extended number of frames over time so as to account for the temporal aspects of the understanding problem. Uh, the specific task that we demonstrate here is the viewing plane classification and also the identification of visibility, which is basically a background frame is where the heart is not visible. The reason we do that, we specifically follow the ISEOG guidelines and consider the four chamber, three vessel, and LVOT views, LVOT being left ventricular outflow tract. The rationale behind doing that is that congenital heart diseases are predominantly apparent in the four chamber view with a minority of conditions apparent in the other views. So the classification becomes 4C view and non-4C view congenital heart diseases. So as a first step towards congenital heart anomaly assessment, you need to do an identification of the viewing planes. So we consider data sets with variable video lengths, variable frame rates between 25 to 76 FPS. There are multiple views in some videos with a 
stochastic presence of background frames because the fetus moves around very randomly when subjected to ultrasound. We do some pre-processing, like cropping to a standard size. We do data augmentation. For the video analysis, we consider contiguous eight frames and artificially construct a video for training. The reason we look at point of care specifically, the aspect that motivates us here is that very recently, there have been players like Butterfly Network and Clarius who have come up with mobile probes. Now, this is different from your standard portable ultrasound scanners. These mobile probes, and this was demonstrated by, specifically in the case of Butterfly Network in late 2017 by their founder, where they scanned his wrist and it was apparent on his iPhone. So they allow a USB plug and play kind of a system. Fundamentally, they allow conversion of your average smartphone into some kind of an ultrasound scanner, which means that if you could actually deploy computer vision algorithms into that are smartphone friendly, you would actually have a smartphone that can do quite a bit of ultrasound diagnosis. So if you can actually have algorithms that can do this fatal heart anomaly assessment within the resource constraint of your average smartphone, your average smartphone becomes a, you know, a pocket fetal cardio cardiologist, so to speak. So to have an algorithm that is friendly for a mobile system or a mobile platform, the requirements of having you know, a low memory footprint, a low inference time, and a low energy consumption is of importance. In this case, we focus primarily on the first aspect of having a lightweight architecture. We basically use an architecture that is heavily derived out of squeeze excite blocks. And to enhance the performance, we also use trainable attention blocks at intermediate stages. So we use a very simple engineering solution to a video adaptation here from the frame level. The frame level is on top and the video is bottom. We do not really use any LSTMs or other such temporal methods, but simply use time uh, fusion, a special fusion in the time direction, so as to talk of a temporal fusion kind of an formalism for analysis of videos. The reason we do that is because it's very difficult to optimize RNNs to work in resource-constrained settings and do inference with a reasonable time budget. So fundamentally, we consider multiple squeeze excite blocks, have intermediate attention stages that create intermediate fully connected layers, which are fused to create a joint representation, and that does your standard classification. So while a lot of uh, progress has been made for mobile optimized architectures in recent years, because this is a proof of concept, we started with a really simple squeeze excite kind of a system. So we display the results for both the frame level and video level analysis. Usage of intermediate attention blocks does improve performance, quite simply because of enhanced computational bandwidth that we get because of those fully connected layers. But that said, there is quite a bit of future work to be done because this is a really simple architecture in terms of the squeeze excite blocks used, doesn't even do a pruning or a quantization. So these are some of the other future works that we aspire to do in future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions?